was born a killer, yeah. I was meant to win. Yeah. I am down a willing, so I will find a way. Yeah. It took a minute, now it didn't happen right away. Yeah. When nigga hot in the kitchen, you decide to stay. Yeah. That's how it winners made. Yeah. Stick a fork in the hater of my dinner plate. Yeah. I walk into the fire like it took the pain. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Clyde Zone Media Podcast. Today, we have with us none other than the incomparable, amazing CrossFit coach, Justin Kotler, and my co-host, Jamie Latimer. Um, and we're going to talk about all things quarterfinals, uh, the Danielle documentary. We're going to get to all that stuff. Um, but we're right in the middle of team quarterfinals. Workouts yeah. came out yesterday. You are living right in the middle of it right now. I think your teams did some workouts already today. Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, we've some of the teams have done. Uh, actually, I think all of them have done one, the first one with a muscle up one. Uh, and then we had a couple of them wanted to go a little bit differently. So what, they did two and then another one did three, you know, so you had the um, the, the dumbbell snatch workout and then the wall ball workout. So I've gotten to see those three. So I have a pretty good feel. Um, we haven't. I, we haven't done the fourth one yet, uh, the deadlift, uh, shoulder overhead. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I have, I have opinions. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was, uh, it's been good to watch and it's weird with these, these long, you know, periods that you have the scoring windows. Oh my God. It's just like, you know, I wish it would have been two days for the first scoring period and two days for the second. It's, it doesn't need to be more than that with four workouts. It's overkill. These teams, you don't need to be repeating workouts. I mean, come on. Um, so that 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 part of it is is annoying. But honestly, it's like, you know, it's pretty stressless for the, you know, <laughs> because they're doing a workout. You could take a day off if you want, do another workout, take a day off, do it. I mean, it's just, you know, but for scheduling and stuff like that, and for training where you want people to continue to train, you know, it's a it's a bit of a pain in the butt. So but. I think this is this has been one of my pet peeves for a while. I don't think CrossFit listens to the right people. You know, a couple of people complain, I got to work. You can't put the, the window during the work week. But we all go to a CrossFit class in the middle of the week yeah. all the time. These workouts do not take more than an hour. There's no tape on the floor. There's no, like, you don't need six days to do four events. No, absolutely not. Like you're yeah. overcorrecting something that wasn't a problem. Yeah, correct. I felt like the scoring windows were fine in the in the past couple of years. So, um, yeah. you know, I think I, you know, I think they overcorrected because obviously they went from ten to twenty five percent. But at the same time, what are we trying to do here? Like, you know, uh, the ultimate goal of the CrossFit Games, and I understand, you know, the community and stuff, but the ultimate goal is to find the fittest individuals in the world. They're going to find a way to get the workouts done, no matter what the scoring windows are, you know? Um, so ultimately, I'm serious about it, Will, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, you know, I don't think that was necessary. I'm not looking forward to it for individuals at all. Uh, I'm not looking forward to um, age groups and individuals at the same time, especially for us when you've got a camp, you've got a lot of people in person. It just, it, it's hard to, it's hard to do time wise. Um, but even more so than that, it's just, just, you know, like you want to have focused attention on athletes and people, you know what I mean? Like it is it so that, that I don't love. Um, but it is what it is, man, you know? And, and so we're in it now and, you know, we're, we're getting it done and, um, yeah, I, you know, the workouts were, were interesting. Um, you know, a bit different than I feel like they have been obviously without the floor plans. I think they're trying to be more inclusive. I think they're trying to take into account, um, you know, the, the, the ease of, of doing it for whatever affiliate you're in or, you know, wherever you are, as far as not making, you know, not doing handstand walks or, or shuttle runs or things like that. You know, my, my thing though, is it's hard to judge workouts when you haven't seen, the full test. And when I say the full test, I mean like what's coming up in semifinals, mm -hmm. because you would hope that, you know, <clears throat> the qualifying events are placing the right type of people and athletes in the next stage. Right. Um, so I worry a little bit about the fact that we're not seeing 
any, you know, any really heavy barbells, especially, you know, Olympic weightlifting, we're not seeing other than ring muscle ups and not a lot of high skill gymnastics. I'm curious to see what, what that looks like at semis. I think that obviously will expose some people and some teams. Um, but at the end of the day, listen, the, the top 10 teams in the, in the East and the, and the West and, you know, various other places, um, they're going to get through and, and, uh, you know, so your, your best teams are going to get through for sure. Yeah. I think you're safe to say that on the team side, I think on the individual side, it might be a different story. I'm worried about the individual side. I, I, I don't know how you have a quarter. Five. Now, listen, the individual workouts could be completely different, but from what we've seen here, if they are, if it's, if it's similar, where we're, we're talking about not a lot of skill, um, not, you know, not, not very heavy, um, more engine capacity, right. More, more of that type of, I worry a little bit, um, because, you know, take a look at semifinals last year, like, you know, the programming, even the last two years, it's been very skilled, uh, you know, and, and challenging, uh, heavy, uh, and, um, first of all, I hope it's not four workouts. I hope there's five or six scored workouts for quarterfinals. Um, to get to semifinals, especially with the cut down fields in Europe and North America. I mean, this is a big stage. You know, there's a lot of, the, if it's similar to what we've seen now with the teams, you're going to see some big name athletes who don't get through. Uh, and, and um, <clears throat> which happens, you know, year to year. But, you know, I, I think I, I, I'm hoping that we're not looking at it like, oh, we need to make it inclusive because there's 25%. Where, in my opinion, no, like the, the we did that in the open. What we're doing now is we've got to we've got to you know step it up, and we've got to create tests that so we're sending the right athletes to semifinals. You know what I mean? So um, that that to me, but I'm curious to see what you know what it's going to be, and then obviously we won't know per se until semis because we get to semis and quarters you know basically is it has absolutely no link like it's not a it's not an evolution uh then i'm then you know we'll all throw our hands up and be like what the hell is going on here you know um so yeah i'm interested interested to see um but the workouts themselves are are fine i don't have an issue with the workouts <coughs> excuse me especially workout one which was a bear um i think a lot harder than people expected um very, very challenging. Uh, and, um, you know, so I you're hitting all my pet peeves, watch. right? What's that? You're hitting all my pet peeves because workout one uh, is the type of workout I want to see in person. Yeah. It's, it, it yeah. was, it's cool. It was cool to watch. And I also think that it's one of those workouts going in you feel very differently coming away from it than you did going in. I don't think people thought that I don't think people expected to break down the way that they did. I don't think they necessarily looked at the numbers and said, Oh, you know, like I also think there's, there's different ways to strategize it now that I've seen it um, that, that, you know, I would strategize. Uh, I think we would strategize a little bit differently after watching one group do it, you know? Um, but that's cool. I like that. Uh, <clears throat> the issue now is though the scoring window is so big that, you know, you, you get the opportunity to do that. I wish they didn't, you know, I mean, like that's, I feel like that's fine for the open, but I think beyond that, you know, that, that it should be tight enough that you're not able to repeat, or if you do, you're really punished, yeah. you know, like you can't recover well enough to be able to do as well on the next ones. Uh, so you know, but that, that's probably my favorite one of the four. Um, the other ones honestly are just kind of like, whatever. Um, I, I, I watched the snatch one today. It's, it's not honestly for, for athletes that would be at semifinals. It's not that it's okay. It's not that bad, which is fine. I'm, it doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to brutalize you. Um, but again, I just felt like it, it's kind of a, kind of an open style, you know, it doesn't, I, I felt like we could step that up for quarters and make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, and then the wall ball workout, it, you know, everyone does, you know, people do a lot of interval training. There's a ton of rest in there. Uh, you're able to attack it pretty well. I, I think you're going to see uh, very similar times uh, mm -hmm. from the top teams. There's not a lot of separation there for the, for the top teams. It's going to be 
you know, minuscule. Um, and I like to see workouts that, that create a little bit more separation, you know, um, where you're like, Oh fuck, they're good. You know, like, yeah. you know, that team is good. Uh, I think we will see that on the first one though, because I think you're going to see some teams, especially oh. the teams that are just like stud muscle ups and who, you know, who can go and, you know, they and get 20 around and hold that like, wow, that's going to be fun to watch. And you probably see a couple teams and, you know, 190 plus or 200 plus, which is freaking phenomenal, you know, and I, I expect that we will see that, you know, probably from the usual suspects that I'm sure we're yeah. all thinking about. I mean, Noah's popping into my head is going to kill that. Yeah. Noah yeah. Cola. I mean, you know, it was Matilda and, and Lena. I mean, they're all greater ring muscle ups. So, you know, if, as long as they, <clears throat> as long as they strategize correctly, which I'm sure they will, they, they should be able to, you know, murder that workout. For that number three, would you have preferred to see either like strict handstand push up or even wall walks? I feel like the breakdown in wall walks and the time that it takes, if you aren't like speedy, could have yeah. separated. So I would have, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, th I think at this stage, kipping handstand pushups are ridiculous. I don't think they yeah. should be in this stage unless you're doing deficit. I would have been fine with a, with a deficit. Oh, yeah. I would have been yeah. fine with like a two inch deficit, um, mm -hmm. you know, which we've seen in quarterfinals before when we had that, yep. that lunge workout a few years ago where it was, you know, uh, walking lunges with kipping, walking lunges, kipping deficit, walking lunges strict. Uh, I would have, I would have been fine with that. Um, you know, but I feel like the fact that you're alternating partners, uh, strict absolutely would have been fine. Yeah, I, I don't think that would have been an issue at all. Uh, and if it is fine, like I don't, that's there. There needs to be some separation. Like you need to Agreed. punish some people for not, you know, like for for not having the the skills or the capacity to be able to handle something like that. Because uh, you can't tell me we're going to have a workout at, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we're going to have a workout at semifinals that's got 50 kipping handstand pushups. I mean, that's a joke. You know, everyone will will go unbroken or they'll go, you know, 30, come down 20. You know, it's just, it's not hard enough. Um, so, but deficit, I think would have done the job for sure. Uh, I also am just tired of the nine foot target, you know, I, I for, for women, I just, I mean, I'm like enough already. Um, and, uh, and I also think that, uh, I'm, you know, the row, while it's nasty at the end and you go, I'm always a fan of calories instead of, uh, instead of meters, uh, just like that in, the in these stages. Um, but, uh, but it was fine. I mean, I, you know, I watched it and, and it was fine. There were very, for good teams, there's just very few places that hold you up. I mean, you're basically... Yep. You're basically just smashing the whole workout, and then it's just going to come down to a few seconds of who rows faster and uh -huh. and 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 your transitions on handstand pushups because you do have to transition a little more on the second set of stand, handstand pushups after that fifth the fifty wall balls is coming off the wall balls. You'll you'll have to transition a little bit more, um, but generally speaking, it's it's going to be real tight at the top. So when you say fine and you go up an octave. It, it leads me to believe there's a little stank behind whatever you're thinking about these workouts, but we'll let that go. No, I, I don't, I don't, I, I I'm, just think at this stage, you, um, you have to make it, you have to prepare people for what they're going to see in the next stage. You have to, you have to get athletes who will be able to to uh do the movements to you know to perform the movements at the next stage and not go in and stare at a wall nobody wants to see that you know so so ultimately speaking um i just feel like uh that's i mean last year think about what you had at at semis seated legless with a with a legless descent for teams just you had that you had mm -hmm. strict wall facing handstand push-ups you had a ton of ring muscle ups you know, you had handstand walks with pirouettes. You, I mean, you had very challenging high skill body weight movements. We have none of that in, in this, like zero. Um, and I, I mean, are we, are we still calling a, a ring muscle up a high skill uh, gymnastics movement at this point? I don't think so. I think that's just, you know, it's like a bar, you know, same thing. I, if <clears throat> I, I also think that, we're at the point now where, you know, if we, I don't want to go backwards, 
you know, like you've seen these really cool movements last year. Like we should be building on those things. You know, it's, it's kind of like where I used to feel like you'd see it at the games and then you'd see it at semifinals the next year. Right. You'd see it at the games. You'd see it at semifinals. And then maybe a year or two later, you might even see it in the open, something like that. Uh, you know, we saw it in in what we saw in semis in the games last year. We're not seeing in in the quarters at all, you know. Um, so we'll see. We'll see, you know, what that means. Um, the workouts themselves are fine. I don't have an issue with them. What I have an issue with is, is, you know, if we're planning on doing some of the same things we did in semis in the games next year, then I have an issue because I just don't think it's hard enough. Yeah. I yeah. feel like so many of the teams are, they almost like are going to walk in at this point. It's 60% of the teams that sign up are, are going in. I mean, you could make it harder and there might be teams that get a few reps, kind like kind of like open for individuals that just kind of sneak in just because there wasn't a whole lot of competition. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree okay. with that. But I think, see, my thought process is like, I, I'm not looking at it in the matter of like how many teams or who, which teams I'm looking at it more from, from like the, the programming of an event or the programming of a, of a, a competition tells a story. And so the, 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 the evolution and the progression starts in the open, then it goes, builds to quarters, then it builds to semis and then it builds to the games. Um, my concern is that, you know, and I'm not saying we should be doing seated legless in, in quarters, but should we not be touching a rope? What if there's a ton of, of stuff on the rope? Should we not be touching handstand walking? What, what if there's yeah. the ramp? And high level, you know, uh, should we not be doing strict handstand pushups? What if there's strict deficit? You know, you're going from kipping now to strict deficit. You know what I'm saying? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I just feel like the progression, I don't see necessarily the progression that I would love to see. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's just my opinion, right? Like, I'm sure that if you speak to, to 10 other you know, coaches or quote unquote experts, you know, they're going to give you 10 different opinions. Um, yeah. That just happens to be mine. And and I generally look at programming an event as, a, as an evolution, as a progression, it should progress. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, from qualifying stages to the, the competition stage. Um, and I, I feel like we already had the open, you know, which was super basic and it was fine. But but now I just feel like, you know, we 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 could have stepped it up a little bit with some of these movements. Yeah, I I do feel like um, I feel like for teams specifically, it like I've heard a lot of people say we've hinged a ton, like we're doing more deadlifts, we're doing more dumbbell snatches. And in my mind, I like for teams. Yeah, maybe like maybe eight of your athletes in your affiliate did that and put the score up. But uh, the of the four that are going to be on your team, did they do it? Do we like, we kind of do need to retest it. Right. And I also think, what if this is the year of the deadlift? What if, what if at semis we see 405 and 275 pound deadlifts? And then at the games we see the 475, you know, 315 again. So that, that would make sense to me where you're going from the, the open to quarters. You know what I mean? Like I'm just yeah. saying it may, maybe it's the, you know, Dave loves deadlifts and I think Dave mm -hmm. is probably more in control now of things. So the way that I look at it is maybe it's the year of the deadlift, you know, so you're going to see at each, at each stage, you know, an evolution of a deadlift workout, um, which I'm fine with. I'm totally fine. I have no issues with that whatsoever. Um, I'm, I'm a bit surprised <clears throat> we're not seeing a heavier barbell, uh, you know, clean or snatch or overhead squat or some, something a little bit more skilled with a barbell. Um, but maybe we're not going to see that at semis. Perhaps we're not. Yeah. We, you know, I had that year that was all dumbbells, right? I mean, so maybe, maybe that's coming. I mean, you know, you never know. Um, so it's hard to really give constructive criticism without knowing the next stage. Um, but my, my inclination or my, you know, I have a, a sixth sense a little bit that, we're probably going to look back on some of this and be like, hmm, could have done that a little bit differently knowing what we know now. So yeah, absolutely. That, that's kind yeah. of the way I look at it. So, so to wrap up this team thing, one of the handful of things that makes teams hard to, to follow 
for the season is we don't know who's on the teams. Yeah. Nobody has to declare what you don't have to declare till you go to semis or it's something goofy like that. Well, you got six, so you can, you know, <clears throat> you've got, but it doesn't have to be the same group from quarters. Doesn't have to be the same group at semis. Doesn't have to be the same group at, at the games. Um, it just has to be two, four of the six. So, as, you know, you can kind of mix and match in, in that. In, in so, that way. so you have two teams in Vegas. Three. Three. Yeah. We have three in-house teams. So I have Rhino Service Dogs. Yep. And that I have a question about. Yeah. So big fans of CJ and Mitch. Yeah. Those are two of my favorite dudes ever. Yep. So I've been following them. They made a post with Ava George and Carson. Yes. Yet on the open leaderboard, Carson doesn't appear and it's Kyra. Yeah. I thought Kyra's going individual. Kyra is going individual. Kyra's the alternate. So she was on of the six, she had better scores, but Carson is doing quarters. Carson will do semis. Um and and you know, they're they're a squad, they're like a team they they you know carson would do the games too so yeah okay that that was just of the six that were you know the six that you have to declare on the team and i'm sure that's all over the place because i i think in a couple of scores that even down at peak did Monica have a couple of the scores that that uh i'm sure yeah i mean i think it's everywhere i think you'll probably see um, you know, I think Kristen Holt that had some scores for Oslo, uh, even though she's not, I don't think she's going to be on the team. I may be wrong. Maybe she's on the team, but I think she probably, if she's competing, she's probably competing in, in the masters. I would think, um, if she's competing, I don't know if she is, uh, but, but anyway, I think you're going to see that a lot of places. And then obviously, uh, the, the, the athletes that go individual, go individual. And then, you know, you'll, you'll see the. You'll probably see like the real team um, this week, and then at semis for sure. So, so then I have so Rhino. You guys, okay, go you ahead. guys actually only put six on your roster for each of those teams, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys did it the right way. I appreciate that. <laughs> were there were there people who put more? Oh yeah, there's people who put like thirty. Oh yeah, no. And then no. and you honestly well, have no clue. Yeah, well, no, no, no we, restriction. Yes. Uh, if your affiliate's only putting together one team, it's just the best scores from uh, yeah. your affiliate, right? The whole squad. Wow. Yep. Yeah. But you have multiple teams, so you have to separate them out early. Yeah. Um, but like Peak, I think they only have one team. Yep. So anybody who works out there can contribute to the score. Well, listen, if anybody beats Noah or Tola, I guess that got more power to them. I can't imagine that, that that's happening. But like Annika could beat. Yes. Filled and right. For sure. Well, I think she did on the majority of the workouts. So then we, I have Rhino CrossFit Dogs. They is it a form of the team that went last year? That's just Roth who's still on that team. So I have Roth and Nikita. Yep. Most of the scores were Allie. Is she going team or indie? No, she's individual. So there's a, a um Alina. Um Alina Ward, who was at semis last year, she was a semis athlete in the Northwest. And then uh, Emily, her name is Emily Torres, um, who didn't compete last year because of an injury. Um, So it did pretty well the year before in quarterfinals, didn't make semis, but uh, she just started working with uh, one of our coaches, uh, Brendan and um, Brendan Snyder and Emily's great. She, she's, uh, she lives full time in Colorado, but obviously commutes, you know, here and and has been uh, under the underdogs, you know, hat for for a few months. So those are the four who are competing this week in quarterfinals. Well, Zombie, uh, just to clarify, it is D A W G, not D O G. Yeah, D A W G. It's yes. less funny when you when you get the right part, right spelling. So who's the third team? So the third team is um, another. I can't remember that. You know, they made up those names. I mean, that's another dogs team out of Camp Rhino. Uh, Dakota Cole, uh, Sarah, and Skyler. Those are our our four. 
Um, and there, I, I would say, you know, I mean, listen, if they get through the semis, we'll be ecstatic, you know, um, and they're busting their ass to do so. But for sure, you know, like th- this, this week is, is more, more their season. Uh, and then, you know, we'll see how it goes, especially with them cutting down teams, you know, down to 30. And so we'll, I'll be curious to see, um, how, you know, how they do, but yeah, they, they've been busting their ass the last two days and, you know, we're giving them as much support as we can. All right. So now we're going to move to, uh, the Daniel documentary. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I've been pretty vocal on a couple shows since it's airing, um, that I didn't like. I lo- I loved the childhood background story. I yeah. knew it was bad. I didn't know details till this documentary. Um, so it was very enlightening for me. And I really appreciated getting to know kind of the background behind. Yeah. Danielle. Yeah. For Made sure. me understand a lot more. I did not care for the CrossFit piece as much, especially when it comes to her relationship with you. Many people have asked me, is it because you're good friends with Justin that you feel that way? I said, probably that has something to do with it. So I will admit that um, I probably have a bias in that vein. But what I want to do is I want to show one piece of the documentary. It's you explaining what happened and Cooper's response. And Mm -hmm. that really got me upset. And (laughs) that's why I just want to explain that. And then we can talk about this. However much you want are willing to share after that. Yeah, for sure. So here we go. We were going as a company and where we were going as a brand, I don't think was necessarily the best fit for her. You know, we talked about it and I said, look, man, like you guys should really try to talk through this and figure this out. I think you guys owe it to each other to communicate through this and, and make it work. I think. So that, that got me upset. And I, and I will say, I will say this. I hung out with you a lot at semis. Um, There were ups and downs with Danielle during that time. And I know that you guys had had talks. When Cooper comes across that way as her agent, my feeling was, isn't it part of your responsibility as her agent to make sure that those conversations are had and that um, it's not solely on somebody else? Yeah. I mean, well, let me let me first say this. Uh, I thought the documentary was incredibly done. I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought it was very well done. Uh, you know, I I knew like you. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I knew a lot about her background, but specific events that happen and some of the stuff that you see, you know, obviously, <clears throat> you know, it's heartbreaking to see a lot of that stuff and. Um, I thought it was a, a, you know, a beautiful story of someone who was able to, um, utilize their God given gifts, you know, to, to, to get them out of a situation that was, you know, highly dysfunctional and where most people would crumble. So, you know, I, I think it really, I think it really was, you know, an, an incredible, it's, it is an incredible story. Um, I have a very different perspective, I think, of, of, you know, how things were, you know, portrayed a little bit, uh, obviously, because I lived it. Um, you know, I always, th- you know, you have to take into to account that obviously this is Danielle's documentary, right? And and they put it out and, you know, they, they want to, you know, I understand, obviously, that they they want to be truthful, but it's always going to come a little bit from a biased perspective, which I totally understand. Every, you know, I would say everybody's documentary, especially if you agree to do it, right? Unless it's somebody who's doing it from the outside where you maybe didn't agree to do it, um, you know, that 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 might be a little bit different. Um, you know, I I was down, I did that that interview that you saw. Uh, was done at Wadapalooza this year, so it's very fresh. I did that. I did that at Wadapalooza, and I, I t- it, it was a long time. You know, um, it was by about an hour. I, I would say about an hour's worth of footage. I was there for for a very long time. It was very emotional. Um, I there were parts of it where I had to stop. You know, they didn't show that, but there were parts of it where I had to take take five minutes and compose myself and. 
you know, I, I tried to be as truthful as possible with, you know, with, without really, I have to be a little bit delicate. It's a couple of years ago and, you know, I've always kind of, you know, I, I always felt like it wasn't necessarily people's business to know the, the, you know, the ins and outs of the situation, uh, and, and some of the particulars, um, you know, and I think for me, the, the toughest part of watching that, uh, and I appreciated what Danielle said to Lauren Khalil in her interview, you know, um, you know, I thought she was very honest and, and <clears throat> without question, there were certain things that I take blame for. I think I could have been more uh, transparent and honest throughout that season um, with some of the feedback that I was getting from athletes and coaches within the camp who felt that they weren't getting treated the right way. Uh, and I, I could have had some of those conversations instead of being like, you know what, I'll handle it at the end of the season. It'll be fine. You know, we'll, we'll get there because the truth was for the majority of that year, Danielle and I were fine. There was never an issue between Danielle and I, um, you know, I, I, and, and she had mentioned in, in there that, you know, she wasn't necessarily extremely happy with all, you know, more athletes coming in and the camp getting bigger and all those things. And, and I, I, I can understand that from her perspective, you know, um, the one thing that, that I felt like wasn't addressed that you know, that, that bothered me. And I, and I, it still bothers me to this day is I just, I would have loved uh, to hear her or Cooper kind of talk about a little bit taking responsibility for some of the behavior and, and some of the actions. They almost made it sound like, oh, well, she just got kicked out of the camp. No, like there were a lot of things that went into that. I mean, uh, you think I wanted to kick her out of the camp? And at the end of the day, it also didn't, it didn't, that wasn't necessarily the case. There was a you know, there was an opportunity there to, to change behavior and apologize to people. And that, that didn't take place. And when that didn't take place, it just felt like there wasn't anything else we could do at that time. Um, you know, there were some things that happened that, that, you know, I was very upset at the time and I, I probably could have handled my anger better, to be honest, but I don't regret the decision. Um, because it had to be done. I felt like, you know, and, and I, when I look back, I, I still feel like it had to be done. Uh, that all being said, uh, you, you know, when you hear me talk in the doc and I'm, it's still, I love Danielle. I, I'll, you know, I, I'm angry at her still. There's no question about it because I feel like there's some apologies that still need to be made in cer certain respects. And, and I'm sure she's probably upset with me and I, and I'm fine with that. Like, that's okay. And I feel like we're far enough removed that I would love to sit down and have a conversation. And, you know, I feel like we're both, you know, in a place, at least I know I am where I could sit down and have a civil cordial conversation and talk about some of those things and talk about some of the mistakes that were made and take responsibility for the, the mistakes that I made. But I, but I would like to see that reciprocated. And I, and I, I guess that's what frustrating to me is I just, I felt like that could have been done in the documentary. It could have been done without throwing her under the bus too, you know, where it just could have been like, listen, there were, there were some things that I did that I felt bad about. And, you know, like I can understand some of the stuff, you know, I wish it had maybe been handled differently. Like that's all good. I was just frustrated that that wasn't addressed in it. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't love rehashing it because I don't want people to be like, again, you know, so, well, what happened and blah, blah, blah. You know what? It's not really your, your business to know what happened. And I, and I'm not willing to, to talk about some of the specifics because first of all, you know, I think you should never be judged, you know, by, unless it's, you know, a catastrophic mistake, right? Or, or, but you shouldn't be judged, I think, by most people for, for some of the worst mistakes that you make, because you have time to redeem yourself. You have time to, to change and learn from those mistakes. Um, and I, I think, um, I think them just asking me to be a part of it, 
you know, was was a a huge leap of faith that I wouldn't just fucking throw Daniel under the bus. I think it was a I think it was brave. I also think that um, you know, I like I said, you know, some of the interviews that I've seen with her talking about, I mean, it was very touching to me to hear that stuff. You know, it was very meaningful to me to hear that she I, I, you know, I, even though things didn't end up as, you know, as we expected that she took a lot from the time that we spent together. Um, and I'd like to think that I had a, a mostly positive effect on her in, in her career. Uh, and, um, you know, and I, I, I am fully in a place where I, you know, I would like to, to get to that point where she and I can see each other and, and hug and, and feel some of those, you know, feel some of those feelings, you know, that, that we have, because I, again, I, I, I really, I want nothing but the best for her without question. You know, I, I think there's obviously some, some anger that's still there from some of the things and and some of the conversations that I think we still need to have or some, you know, so, but, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, um, I'm still very grateful to have met her, to have known her, to have been able to coach her. She's an incredible athlete. You know, she's a, just a unique person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope that at some point we can, we can have a conversation and I'd like to do it in person. And, and I, you know, I hope that, uh, hope she's willing to do that. So the last thing I'm going to say on this is I think probably what also contributed to my feelings watching the documentary is I watched the interview with Lauren first that came out before the documentary came out. Yeah. And in that interview, she was, it was very touching and almost like, not almost like she missed you a lot as a coach. We miss her and someone who cared about her so much. And she talked about no other coach that she had after that cared about her. Like you cared about her because yeah. the way you cared about her was real, you know? And when she said that, I was like, Oh my gosh, like she's, she's be, it's, it's becoming aware to her that, that that relationship was pretty good. Yeah. And then when the documentary came out and that was just kind of glanced over, I think that's why it, caught me off guard and shocked me a bit because I was hopeful that like maybe like we could get to a bygones be bygones and maybe not coach her again or anything like that but at least be able to like you say be friendly when you see her give her a hug yeah. um yeah I was very touched by by what she said in the in the interview um no, I'm not going to lie. It was, you know, I, I definitely, there were some, some waterworks, you know, hearing that stuff. And, you know, I think it's hard, <laughs> excuse me, in that, in that form, you know, maybe in that, in that documentary form. Um, I don't know. I, I, I understand what you're saying. And I, I do think there was an opportunity there you know, to, to take some more responsibility. I think that's the thing that, that I will continue to kind of talk about that, that where I, where I felt a little bit, you know, um, disappointed in that, in that sense. Uh, but the hearing her say the things she did to Lauren and, and knowing that I had that positive impact and that effect on her, cause I felt it too, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't make believe it was I, it's the way I felt. I, you guys acted the same behind closed doors with each other as you did as what people see out on the floor. Absolutely. Like, you know, it, and then there, there are things, I mean, I can, I can remember specific, <laughs> I can remember specific workouts and specific things that I knew. I just felt in tune with her emotionally, you know, to, to be able to say the things she needed to hear at the right times, especially during workouts when she was training, when she was practicing. And, you know, it's not stuff that I would repeat. And it's not stuff that you would say to other athletes necessarily because they won't respond that way. You know, she's a different animal, you know, and there were things that you needed to say. And I mean, she even talks about it. I don't remember if it was in the documentary when she talks about it or if it's, 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 it's in, she's talked about it before where, you know, Danielle is not, she doesn't respond to like, uh, 
pie in the sky kind of, you know, that, that, uh, self-help book, you know, like the secret type thinking where it's like, you know, I'm the prettiest and I think I'm the best. And if I do those things, no, she didn't respond to that. Like she responded more to tough love than anything else. And there were specific times where that needed to happen. And then there were specific times where like, I had to appeal that to that animal instinct, kind of like that Michael Jordan type thing where like, she needed to have that chip on her shoulder to be able to like, feel like, oh yeah, that's the way they feel about me. And I'm going to fucking step on their neck. Like she just has that in her, you know, which I loved, like, <laughs> I just loved it, you know? And so I felt like I could, I could trigger that at specific moments. And, and I felt like, you know, but I also was able to, to, she knew how much I cared about her. She knew that it was real and genuine and she knew how much Ashley cared about her, my wife and how much my kids cared about her. And you know, Ivy dyed her damn hair blue, you know, <laughs> like to, for when, you know, my daughter, when, when, when she went to, to semis and, you know, I just, so it was very painful and very emotional, the whole thing. And it has been, you know, ever since, to be honest, I mean, there's a part of me that, you know, will always think what if, you know, because I felt like we were on this trajectory and she was making this incredible growth. And uh, I mean, obviously she's still one of the best in the sport. I mean, that's not to say that, you know, that I maybe, you know, could have gotten her on the podium or maybe more. I mean, I know she dealt with some health issues, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I, I, like I said, you know, I always, w w when, when I started working with her, I, my intention was, you know, I'll, I'll be with her for the rest of her career, you know, and I felt like we had a, a great connection um or as good a connection as as you can have with danielle because there's all, always going to be some she just you know there's always going to be some volatility there's always going to be some drama and that's okay that's who she is it's part of what makes her great part of part of what makes her such a unique individual and 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 why people you know either love her or hate her you know you you generally don't have like blah feelings <laughs> toward Danielle, it's, I, it's a, generally, she's very polarizing. It's one at one end of the spectrum or the other. Um, but that's what makes in, interesting individuals. You know, we don't, honestly, we don't have enough of that in, in CrossFit. Yeah. Like, I feel like we need more of that. You know, it's, it's good for the sport. It grows the sport. It creates more visibility. Um, but to that. yeah, but anyway, I mean, I could, I'm sure we could go on and on yeah. and I could talk a lot so, about it. So you that's know, but, the rear view mirror. Yeah. But looking at your windshield, you've got a lot to look forward to. Yeah. You've got two athletes, one male, one female, poised to podium. They are on the precipice of a great year, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I mean, listen, um, you know, they're both really, really good. You know, um, I mean, whenever you talk about athletes, that are ranked in the top five in the world, you know, you're talking about obviously special athletes, uh, you know, and um, the, the biggest thing from here, and I think this is just the way most, you know, it, it, it's, it's the way most coaches will feel. And, and, and I know the way I feel is, is, is that the key is now uh, getting them to, semifinals and the games as healthy as humanly possible. Like, you know, the work, you know, you're talking about like Ricky's a little bit different because, because Ricky's a bit more seasoned and, and with Alex, there are some, still some things I think trajectory wise, which she's still more on this type of trajectory. Um, you know, like, I mean, it's wild to see what her strength numbers are doing. And, you know, I mean, she's just, I, I, I don't know in the next couple of years, you know, and I, I, people get on me a little bit. I think when I say this, cause they're always like, you're putting so much pressure. It's not pressure. I mean, I, it, pressure is a privilege, first of all, and, and expectations are a good thing. It just means that you're good. I, th I think she has the opportunity to kind of redefine the sport um, for when you talk about someone who's as big and as strong as she is. And, and I think ultimately what she's going to be able to do and not yet, but in another year or two, that's not to say she can't podium this year. I'm just saying that she's nowhere near where she's going to be. I think Ricky is, is, you know, he's in the peak of his career. So, you know, it's, 
I think Ricky would have won the games last year, and that's with all respect to, to, to Jeff and Roman. But when you look at the programming, there wasn't a bad event at the games for Ricky. In fact, there were five or six events that Ricky would have won. Like, I don't even have a question about that. He wins the game, and I don't think it would have been close. Um, now, you don't know if you're ever going to get that again. You know, that's just right. the way it is. Uh, and also, you know, it just depends. It depends on – are you healthy at the time? Are you feeling really good at the time? You know, like he's been battling a few injuries this year since Wadapalooza. You know, we're not going to talk the specifics, but it's been a bit up and down, honestly, over the last several weeks. And, you know, so we've got to get through quarters. I think, honestly, for both of them, I, I'm not, I mean, they're both really good, so they'll be fine, but I'm not sure you're going to see the type of performance necessarily that you're used to seeing with them because they're both kind of dealing with some nagging things right now. But it's not, I think the nagging things are nowhere near serious enough that we're not going to get them to 100% by semis. And then my goal is to have them feeling as confident in their bodies as humanly possible to be able to handle whatever test comes at them in, in Dallas. And I think it's a fine line that you see with, with some athletes going into the games where you've got to be ready for the volume, but you have to be at your physical tip top shape. You can't be overtrained and you can't be crushed. And I think you see half the field come into the games are done. They're done before they even start. And you can see it on day one or day two. I think we saw it with some big names last year, and I'm not going to talk about who it was, but you, we saw some big names last year who you looked at and you were like, what the hell is going on? And it just, I think it just comes from you going, you, you, you're overtrained, you're not feeling great, you have a bad first day, and you're done. And my key is going in, having them feeling as good as humanly possible. Um, and, and that, you know, I've kind of, Kind of tinkered a little bit with with volume and with cutting down specific things this year as far as metcons doing a little bit more monostructural just to stay healthy and um i feel like you know i feel like that's helping i feel like taking more rest days is helping i think um not being glued to the not not feeling like you have to do what's on the page if your body that day doesn't feel like it's going to benefit you, which I think a lot of people are married to the program. And, and if they look at the program, they're like, fuck, if I don't do the program, I'm not going to get better. And that sometimes is a disservice to them. Uh, so there's a lot more stuff by feel, especially with those two uh, this year. And um, so, yeah, I you know, I'm obviously – extremely optimistic that if they are feeling great and if they are healthy, which I expect them to be and intend them to be, uh, they both have the full capacity to be on the podium. So I'm going to, we're, we're coming up on the hour already. So we're going to try rapid fire with Justin. Okay. I'm going to hit you with some quick questions. I'm going to start with one in the chat and I'm going to build on it. And that cool. is, Serious question. Does Justin ever get tired of coaching or bored of it? No. <laughs> and I would say, so then I'm going to follow up with that is you have Ricky who had to sit out last year. Yeah. Um, injured, couldn't participate, probably going nuts after all he's been through in his career. You have that on one side. You have this up and comer on the other side who everything is brand new. Yeah. Going into it all. Doesn't even know what she's capable of. Is that what makes it makes coaching great? I I think the ability to be able to help someone reach their maximum potential, not just in sports, but also in life. You know, I just feel like that to me is how to get bored of that. You know, um, now listen, without question, uh, you know, I run a business too, so I get I get tired of doing a lot of the back end stuff, <laughs> the stuff that's not you know, the fun stuff, you know, like doing payroll or, you know, handling, you know, dealing with social media or doing that kind of stuff, which is not, you know, I don't love, but, um, the coaching side of things is, is the, is the great joy, you know, that I, that I have, I mean, listen, being in the, in the, in the gym, um, I mean, on a daily basis with Alex and I, I, you know, I wish I was Ricky's different, you know, he's in Australia, you know, we talk all the time, but it's not, this is quite the same, you know, but, 
being able to be in the gym and, and see the progress that Alex has made. I mean, I always say, you know, it's like the, the, the best part of my week is, is watch, you know, watching her progress and seeing the things that she does. And obviously that, that spans to, to all the athletes that I coach, you know, with her and Ricky and Sarah and Caitlin and Braun, et cetera, you know, and, you know, there's more obviously, but <clears throat> I, I, you know, just see them being able to achieve the things that they set their minds to and the goals and, and that stuff. I, I know, I know I don't ever get tired of that. So Jake Chapman asks, um, do you still coach any plebes getting their first pull up? I, I don't, uh, I haven't in a long time, but when I owned an affiliate, I taught foundations for 11 years. So that was like every day. That was one of my favorite things was, you know, being able to be on the ground floor with people who just get into CrossFit, like being able to be that influence when they first start, you know, I enjoyed that as much as I do coaching elite athletes, to be honest with you. Like that was just so cool. So I haven't done that in a while. Um, but, uh, but I do love doing that, you know, for sure. So you say the back end business owner stuff is, is tedious, but when you got into this game, right, you were an affiliate owner, doing your thing. You guys had a lot of successful teams back then. You hook up with Carrie Pierce. That is a match made in heaven. You evolve into owning this underdogs business. Could you have ever imagined where, when you started this whole journey in CrossFit, that this is where you'd end up? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure that I expect that I, you know it's hard to say like i don't know that i expected to evolve you know into being <clears throat> i guess one of the more visible coaches in the space um but my goal when i when i started when i opened an affiliate i started coaching elite athletes and we're talking 15 years ago my goal was to help change people's lives through fitness first. But then it, my, my goal just from being in sports, you know, forever and being a competitive collegiate athlete, et cetera, like I wanted to coach elite athletes. Like I felt like I had something to give. Uh, and as that started to evolve, uh, I, you know, I, I felt like I could, I felt like I could affect people positively. I felt like, like I could, I could help them. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure, you know, that, that this necessarily was the iteration that I expected it to, to take, but, you know, did I feel like I could be successful, you know, doing it? Yes, I, I, I definitely did. And, um, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't think necessarily that that's arrogance. I just, I just felt like, you know, this was something that felt like a second calling for me after music, you know, where I felt like I had, I had a God given ability to be able to, to sing and affect people that way. And then, you know, I, I had a, a way to be able to get through to people and affect people in this way. So it's, it's ended up being, you know, obviously the, you know, my, my calling or second calling, I would say. So I have a music question for you, but before that, yeah, like you were the first coach we ever had on this show. Wow. Many years ago. I did not know that. It's because Kat, my co-host on the yes. round table, is, was a grid league junkie. Yeah, sure. Right? Can you and imagine she, that's 10 years ago now? And she knew you from that, and that's why yeah. we reached out to you. And then we learned that like getting coaches on was a cool thing. <laughs> right? It was just a different perspective. Yeah. And other podcasts weren't doing that. Yeah. Until we kind of started that ball rolling. And now it's like a staple, right? Yeah. Coaches are on everything. Yeah, for sure. Even um, people that I, aren't coaches I, I are coaching. It's more of an observation than a than a, a question, but yeah, it, it's really cool how it's evolved. Yeah. My music question: Did you see the "We Are the World" documentary? I have not seen it yet. Is it a must see? Oh my gosh, Justin! Justin. All right. Well, now it's just, on my list just for the Stevie part. Oh yeah, it's worth a sure. watch. Oh, Stevie, Michael. There's a lot. So now I can't even ask you the follow up. So, oh, sorry to disappoint you. Spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. Bob Dylan's on the recording. Yeah. He's afraid to sing in front of everybody, all these uh, stars. Yeah. Right. Guy's been around for 40 yeah. years at this point, right? And he's afraid to sing in front of everybody. And he doesn't know how they want him to sing. 
So Stevie right. sits down at the piano. Yeah. And he's like, Bob, we just want you to like, we are the world. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so Stevie yeah. had to sing it for him like Bob Dylan. That's for Bob to get it. Oh, I got to watch it. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. No, I, I, I'll, I'll put it on my list for sure. Yeah, it's like an hour and a half or something. Okay. Uh, cool. and it, but it's really good. Ah, and the it, kids go to bed. <laughs> and if you're a, a music fan of the 70s and 80s, like, yeah, it was everywhere. Sure. Yeah. Everyone. Uh, Jan Clark says Bob Dylan was overrated in the chat. Wow. Not, uh, not back look, my favorite singer in the world, but man, maybe that, as a singer, but go back and look at some of those songs. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. His catalog's pretty impressive. Yeah. I don't know if. Like him and the Beatles, probably together, catalogs. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, ridiculous. Prince, obviously, mm -hmm. Stevie. So there was a question here from Wad Zombie, okay. um, not Wad Zombie, uh, Bruce Wayne. Bruce. Okay. Who would be the one athlete you'd love to coach? I know you answered this a couple of years ago. Yeah. With Ricky, yeah. that came true. Oh, yeah, or yeah, yeah. are you looking to kind of phase out of? doing multiple athletes nope um it, it would have to be very special right now like it'd have to be somebody super special um yeah man shit i don't know that's a really hard question and i i always am it's always uh, i don't feel right most of the time um saying an athlete who already has a coach I just feel like it's disrespectful. Yeah. It's like a you poaching know? thing that you don't want to go down. No. And, and I feel like um, when I said Ricky, he didn't have a coach and, and that was the truth, you know, at that time. Um, I will say this, that, you know, one of the highlights of my career um, has been being able to coach Sarah Sigmund's daughter, you know, who I still coach. Uh, and I say that, just because, you know, I, I always knew Sarah and, and we were cordial, uh, you know, and, and uh, she was friendly with Carrie. And, and so I got to know her through that. And, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get to really understand <clears throat> what type of human being she was. I just knew, you know, listen, like she's, there's very few like icons of the sport, like people who are just, you know, they're like, you talk about the icons of music who, who walk down the street and, and people are crying, you know, and then getting them to sign their photos and things like that. I mean, I, there are a few of those in CrossFit. Sarah is one of them. What I saw at, at you know, at the European semifinal last year you, you, with people lined up around the block to meet her and people like crying when they meet her and wanting them to sign their, her, their faces and things like, you know what I mean? I'd never seen that before. I mean, Carrie was popular, you know, like other people I coach are popular, but there's a whole nother level of popular, but, but getting to know her and, and the fact that she is exactly the way she is on screen to her fans and behind the scenes was just one of the coolest things that I've ever experienced. And, you know, obviously she's dealt with a lot of health issues over the last few years and we're, we're trying to get her you know, to a place where, you know, she's, she's backed and, and confident and competitive and, and those things. But regardless of what happens with that, um, I, I think just getting to know her and, and, you know, kind of getting to experience just the light that shines from her as a human being, I, you know, it, it really, it's amazing because she is a special human. And, and, and so I know that did not answer Bruce's question at all. Um, but it kind of tied into saying like, I just feel lucky to, you know, have been able to know her and, and to have been able to, to work with her these, these last it's, it's been about a year now, you know? So it's, uh, I've been very lucky. I feel like one this. of the coolest, nicest, most genuine people I've ever met in my it's life. It's crazy. Honestly. Uh, Wad Zombie says, I'd want to coach Susan Clark. That's only if you're ring chasing. I mean, what five times, six times, seven times champ. In the yeah. division, yeah, I mean, um, pretty special. There's two more good questions, and then we'll let you go for the oh, day. I'm, I'm good. I don't have to pick no. up Ivy for another half hour. <laughs> uh, Donald Ortega, 
if you could, if you could build an athlete, what would he put more emphasis on mental or physical strengths? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, man, that's, here's the thing. I, it's as kind of like sellout of an answer. This is they have to go hand in hand does. Cause, cause if you don't have the physical attributes, <laughs> You could be mentally tough, but here's the deal. If you if you can't do a handstand push-up, I don't care how mentally tough you are. <laughs> if they come up in a workout, you can't do them. If you can't run a, a six-minute mile, I don't care how mentally tough you are, what you've experienced in your life, like you, you're not going to be able to do it. So so ultimately they, they they both lift each, they lift themselves up. You know what I mean? They're they're but I can tell you this right now, um, that <clears throat> when you get to the level that, that these athletes are at, you know, and when I say these athletes, I'm talking about like high level semifinals and games athletes, right? You get to that level. The difference physically is generally pretty minuscule. Like it, 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 there are the one percenters in specific movements. Yes. But the, the athletes who are mentally and emotionally the toughest have a massive advantage. I mean, I, you know, like I felt like I coached an athlete who physically was not one of the top five or 10 athletes in the world, but mentally she might've been the toughest athlete in the world in carry. And she got the most out of everything because of her ability to handle the ups and downs in competition, to deal with emotional stress and to like the Ted Lasso quote, you know, um, wh where you, you've got a, what, who, what's the animal again that has the 10 second memory that he talks uh, about? No, I can't. Of course, it's, I, I can't remember. It's uh, yeah. Goldfish. Mm-hmm. Gotta be a goldfish. Be a goldfish. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that, and that no one has ever done that better than she has, um, you know? So, and <clears throat> so the physical attributes are amazing, but over the 15 years that I've been in this sport, I've seen people who you look at and you're like, holy shit, you know, they're, they're so physically gifted that you're just like, oh, they're going to win. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And then they never do. And, and, and ultimately, and it's not because of injury. It's not, it's because they can't handle the emotional stress. They can't handle the 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 daily ins and outs of that. You know, they get <clears throat> they get so obsessed about the highs and lows of workouts during training and all that kind of stuff. Which is, if you do that, you're done. You're done before you start. You know, because every day is going to be different depending on how you feel and what's going on in your life and how much sleep you get and all this and all that. You know, you have to be able to maintain this level of of you know, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's gotta, it's gotta almost just be boring in a way, you know, where you're, you're not, you're not dealing with that or you're not reacting to it. Uh, and, um, so I would say that, that, you know, both of them are incredibly important, but then I think once you get to a certain level that it, the mental and emotional aspects, uh, are, are, you know, massive. I mean, they're, and it's hard to teach very hard to teach. It's funny because when I look at your athletes, you know, the common phrase now is they got that dog in them. Yeah. Which goes right along with underdogs, your old dog mentality. Carrie had that dog in her. Yeah. Ricky has that dog in him. Yes. Last year at semis, I finally saw the dog in Alex. And I still think Alex is working on it. I, I, I still think Alex, you know, burpee, I would not yet. What's that? That burpee workout against one hundred percent, without question. I think I think she has the dog in her when it's something she's confident with. But you talk to the athletes that are, you know, the Lauras and the Tias and the you know the Mats and the you know even the Pats and the and the Brents and those guys who are there every year, like they just it doesn't matter. They just know like okay by the end I'm going to be where I need to be. You know, and like they don't let them, they don't get, you know, get worked out or worked up over a specific movement or a workout that's that, you know, that, that maybe doesn't go their way. Um, and I also think, you know, with Alex, 
we're still working on like it's hard sometimes to acknowledge and accept who you are as an athlete compared to who you were as an athlete. And when I, when I say that, I just mean there's a lot of workouts that Alex still sees herself as the athlete two and three years ago and not the athletes that that's now ranked top five in the world. She, she hasn't fully accepted it or embraced it. Uh, and when you do that as an athlete, you become fucking scary. Like, you know, because it, you know, it, it <clears throat> you have the confidence to be able to, to go after it and you have the expectation that, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to crush this. Like I'm going to do well on this. And, and, you know, um, that's not an easy thing to develop. It's a very challenging thing to develop. Uh, and, um, we haven't seen a ton of athletes, you know, over the years able to do that. Um, you know, and it's exciting to, 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 to be able to think that, you know, you have an athlete or, or see that in somebody that, that that's possible. Um, you know, that's very exciting. So last question from the chat. From Kenneth Lap, could Carrie Pierce make a comeback if she wanted to? One, she's told me definitively she does not want to. No, she doesn't want to. Um, I, I mean, listen, I had never put it past Carrie. You know, um, I think, I, I you know, I think her focus now is obviously on 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 a, having a family. Um, you know, is it something I could see eventually where she makes a comeback? And if she was going to make a comeback, I think it would be, you know, in the Masters and age group division. Um, but, you know, the sport continues to evolve. And when I say that, I mean, you see the numbers, the strength numbers, you know, that are that are being put up now uh, by the women. Uh, and it's... I mean, it's, it's freakish. I mean, it's downright scary, you know? Uh, and <clears throat> I think that there do, I, I think Carrie obviously is mentally tough enough to, to she probably could, could come back and, and, and even make the games, you know, if she devoted a year to it, she probably still could in the, in the open division. But I, I look at some of the workouts and some of the movements when you talk about, sandbags and yokes and heavy cleans and heavy squats and you know some of those things machines like some of the numbers you know that you know the power output numbers that you see it's just getting like you got to be built different you know what i mean like it's just getting it's just getting freakishly freakish i don't know that that's like i don't know i don't know i mean it's wild so i think she's very sure. happy what's that happened there's one thing for sure. There are home runs that she would still win. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Without question. You know, I, I don't think there's any question, but I do think as far as the strength numbers every year, they, they get harder and harder to attain for the athletes that were used to the numbers in a specific era in a specific, you know, like you see those numbers. And then all of a sudden a year or two later, it's like, what the hell? Like, Whereas, you know, the numbers have just gotten bananas now, you know, so um, it's, so. it's, I, I'm glad you said this and this, I promise will be my last question. Oh, um, so with that, like, you know, my, my coach and owner is Christy O'Connell, yep. um, Kristen Holta, yep. like the era of that smaller yeah. athlete seems to be going away. Like in wow. just kind of what you're saying, but then you have someone on the men's side, like a Colton Mertens. Yeah. Defying the odds. Well, Colton's a unicorn. Colton's also yeah. unbelievably strong, like ridiculously strong, like so compact in the way he's built. Um, but Will I also think there's that on the women's side. Uh, well, Mal was not. Mal was built very similarly to Carrie, and I felt like we were seeing it with Mal. Now, you know, obviously, what's happened there, but you know, I mean, as far as physical attributes are concerned, I, I felt like she's probably the only one you know that's built like that right now when you look at the top even the top 10 i mean is there anyone in the top 10 who's who's shorter than 52 i don't think so uh ariel's pretty short yeah she's about yeah. that about yeah she's that, about five. that 5253 five, yeah so ariel is still still hanging in with with that but i mean <clears throat> you're seeing more and more now that 
that it is, you know, it's like that five, five to five, but eight ish built like a brick shit house, like able to handle strong man. They're two different body types. Who say that? Ariel Christie. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Ariel Stouter for sure. Um, you know, and, and especially like lower body legs, trunk, you know, um, yeah, I think it's going to get harder and harder. I, I do. I just think that's the evolution of the sport. It's going to get harder and harder for athletes of, of that size, uh, especially on the women's side. Yeah. I mean, you can get away with it in a way, you know, I, I guess this, this young girl from, from, uh, Switzerland, Mir- Mirjam, Mirjam, Mir- yeah. Mirjam. Uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, some of the numbers she's putting up are astounding. You know, you look at it. I mean, her engine numbers are incredible. She's high rock. She runs a sub five, uh, 21, five K f- 20 sub 21 minute, five K. Uh, apparently she has some things on her Instagram or her YouTube where she did like 350 wall balls unbroken and 60, Jesus. 60 squats at hundred kilos unbroken, like some like ridiculous numbers, power endurance numbers. Um, but we'll see, <laughs> you know, um, what, what, what's that going to look like at semis? I, you got to show me I'm like Missouri. Yeah. I'm the show me state, right? Like, yeah, show me. I, I, I got to see it to, to believe it. You know, uh, we've seen a lot of people in, in the past finish incredibly well in the open and, and then go to semis and, and get crushed. I'm not saying that's going to happen to her. I, I just got to see it. You know, if she goes and she does it and she qualifies for the games, then we're all going to be like, okay. She's she's the real deal, you know. She goes to semifinals and finishes thirty seventh. Then we'll know that too. Yep. Well, my friend, as always, this has been a blast. I could chat with you all night. Yeah, thank but, you. Um, always you a pleasure. Family obligations. My yeah. wife just came home, so go have dinner with her. I got uh, it. I want to thank you for jumping on and being so transparent. Through yeah, it's my pleasure. Time. Always a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you. Can't wait to see you back out on the road, man. Thanks, man. Me too. All right. With that, thank you everybody in the chat for contributing to the questions. And we'll see everybody next time on Clydesdale Media Podcast. Bye, guys.